Ooh, hey, what's up? So today's video is all about sleep because I'm getting a lot of it at the moment and apparently it's actually a really important thing for humans. Who knew? This is all based off of Matthew Walker's excellent Why We Sleep book. It's a really good book and I highly recommend reading it. But today I'm going to try to give you a summary of all the important bits that I gained from it and all the really interesting insights. And so today's video is split up into these parts and uh, let's get straight into it because this is going to be long. So the first part is why and when you feel sleepy. Your circadian rhythm regulates your entire body and all of its functions. Circadian rhythm is the up and down motion of energy of your body, which is controlled by basically your body clock or the suprachiasmatic nucleus in your brain. And so basically your body has an internal clock that regulates all other processes in the body. So first of all, that was really interesting for me as a non-medical student. Then melatonin is the darkness hormone that is released at night that makes you sleepy and triggers the beginning of sleep processes. And so your circadian rhythm and something called adenosine, which is like sleep pressure, are the two factors that affect how and when you feel sleepy. So adenosine, this chemical, and the circadian rhythm usually work in tandem together to make you feel sleepy at night, but sometimes, even if you haven't slept and that sleep pressure is built up and you feel really sleepy and you've had an all-nighter, but you, your circadian rhythm peaks as it does around midday or just before midday, you can feel like really energetic and like you've got a second wind. And it's this buildup of adenosine, this sleep pressure throughout the day, that makes you sleepy at the end of the day. Uh, and so this is the circadian rhythm and adenosine together are what control whether or not you feel sleepy. Really interesting. And these things are changing every day, going up and down and affecting each other. And that's what makes you feel sleepy. Your circadian rhythm dips in the afternoon. And so that's why a lot of people have a midday slump and why so many people, if they can have it, have an afternoon nap because it's when your circadian rhythm is really dipped and makes you feel quite tired. In addition to this, kids' circadian rhythms run much later than adults. That's why kids are so sleepy in the early morning and wide awake at like one in the morning. And some American schools that have done experiments where they push school start times later to be more in line with kids' natural, natural circadian rhythms have seen an increase of like 200 SAT points uh, per you know, individual kid in that. And so it really does go to show that if you adjust school times and that to fit kids' natural circadian rhythms, you can benefit the kids and their learning so much. So next up are the two different phases of sleep. Okay, there's a couple of different subcategories, but the two main phases of sleep are REM sleep, rapid eye movement, and NREM sleep, non-rapid eye movement. Yeah, whatever. And so basically, NREM sleep is the reflection part of your sleep where your body goes through what happened during the day and kind of processes and sees what happens during the day. And then REM sleep is the integration of new and old memories and facts and the meshing of the new stuff that happened with you in the day into your long-term memory. During REM sleep, your thalamus, which is a part of your brain, uh, receives sensory info from memories, from dreams, and then goes about acting out these sensory uh, pieces of information. So that's why when you're in REM sleep, your body is paralyzed. Because as you dream, and as your brain processes all the sensory information given to it from the thalamus and from the rest of your body, your body attempts to act out the sensory information. Moving an arm, shouting, jumping up and down, running, all these things that you experience in a dream, but that your body doesn't do because wisely it's paralyzed. The author of this book also conjectures that a while ago when monkeys lived in trees and that they couldn't have that much deep REM sleep because if they were completely paralyzed they could fall off the branch and fall to their deaths and so when monkeys moved down from the trees and moved to kind of living on the ground it allowed those monkeys or you know ancient ancestors of monkeys to have more REM sleep and for their brains to spend more time in that deep processing uh, memory forming connection forming REM sleep and this is potentially maybe what led humans to developing uh, from our ancient uh, monkey ancestors or something like monkeys um, into the incredibly intelligent beings that we are today that move from the trees to the ground allowed us to get a lot more REM sleep and allowed the, the really high level cognitive, emotional uh, and social aspects that, that make us different from other animals to develop because we could now have more of this really enriching REM sleep on the ground. Just a really interesting evolutionary concept. The importance of REM sleep is also espoused upon a lot by the author because of uh, he talks about alcoholic mothers and the babies that they give birth to have a marked decrease in the amount and quality of their REM sleep 
and alongside that goes all the mental and physical developmental problems that a lot of uh, al babies who are born from alcoholic mothers have. He also goes on to talk about how autistic people measure far lower quality and length of REM sleep and this also potentially has an impact on their emotional and cognitive development in certain ways. On the other side of the coin also though, the author talks about how REM sleep and that has inspired a lot of geniuses to come up with some of their greatest ideas. In particular he mentions Thomas Edison uh, particularly engineering himself naps where he would hold a steel ball in his hand and then in his chair fall asleep and then drop the steel ball onto like a metal uh, trash can lid or something so that it made a huge noise and woke him up. And that quick brief nap allowed him to think about a whole lot of great ideas and invent so many cool things. And that a whole lot of geniuses like rock stars uh, and people who, who do especially creative work have come up with some of their best ideas when sleeping or napping. And he goes on to talk about how important REM sleep is because it takes the memories and the facts and the information you learnt in the day and intertwines them in new, weird, wonderful and abstract patterns that is how creativity forms. So this next section is on what sleep does and what a lack of sleep does to your body. And so he talks a lot about sleep deprivation and how your body acclimatizes to sleep deprivation eventually, which is really obviously not good because then you're tired and chronically sleep deprived but you don't feel like it and your body kind of just exists in this permanent state of Ugh. I've got personal experience with this obviously being a varsity student, but obviously you have to weigh up whether or not you want to pass your course or get more sleep. And so it's this constant uh, toss-up that he was talking about in the book as well. But he gave a specific example of how professional athletes are remarkably less efficient in their performance. Like, you know, they can actually measure it with finish times and overall start and finish times compared to usual performance measures and that. And when athletes are sleep deprived, they don't perform as well as when they have had a good night's rest. And the same goes for medical professionals, for intelligent people working on mathematical proofs and that they don't perform as well as when they are, have had a good night's rest. He also talks about how sleep consolidates memories from the day and separates the emotional impact of what happens to you during the day from the factual information. Basically, when you sleep, your body doesn't have the stressful chemicals in it, like the high levels of cortisol and that, that make traumatic experiences so much worse to experience. And so when you're sleeping, you don't have these stressful chemicals in your system anymore. And so it allows you to process this information and get over traumatic experiences much easier. I thought that was very interesting. Um, he also talks about how psychiatric disorders are all made worse by, and sometimes even caused by, sleep disorders. And also how this thing called beta amyloid, a toxic chemical, builds up in your brain, in your frontal lobe, and prevents proper sleep generation. And this is what may even cause or worsen Alzheimer's and how deep sleep is completely affected by this chemical and how this lack of sleep ultimately kills a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, my grandpa actually had dementia and so it's particularly interesting to me. He also explains how the chemicals leptin and ghrelin in your body, chemicals that control how hungry you are and how satiated you are, are directly impacted by how much sleep you've had. And so when you are sleep deprived, you feel much more hungry and you feel much less full. And I've actually experienced this myself now in the holiday um, I've been getting a lot more sleep. I've been getting eight hours every night, which is the most I've actually had in years, and I have not been as hungry during the day. Okay, granted, because of coronavirus and that, I've been sitting at this desk all day, but I think it's quite interesting, because I think definitely I've seen it. When you're sleep deprived, you're far more hungry, and your body perhaps doesn't use the food you consume as efficiently. Also, deterioration in sleep quality at old age is a linked deterioration in overall health. Uh, it talks about how 90% of deep NREM sleep disappears, when people get over the age of like 70 or so. And the parts of brain, parts of the brain that ignite healthy sleep are the first parts to deteriorate as we age. And so also talking about how potentially a cure for mortality, the, the secret to immortality being proper good sleep for the rest of our lives and well into our old age, super interesting to me. The next section I wanna talk about are the things that affect sleep, basically environmental factors. And so the invention of electric light allowed people to change their circadian rhythms because now there was this bright light source in the evening that was disrupting your natural circadian rhythm, which was used to the sun going down and okay, it's night time now, time for your body to sleep. But now often your body thinks it's still the middle of the day when you're emitting this bright blue light, blue light from screens and LEDs into your eyes uh, at a late hour of night. Now on a side note here, a uh, very interesting fact that he explained and I thought was just so interesting. All life began in water. 
where the yellow wavelengths of light are stripped away by the depth and the refraction of water and so only blue light is left and life developed in water. The earliest uh, single-celled amoebas and that developed in water somewhere and so when the first eye developed, the first eyelid, it developed in water and there was only blue light around in water because of the refraction of the water surface. And so that is why the human eye is so sensitive to blue light. Because billions of years ago, when single-celled amoebas and that developed, uh, single-celled organisms developed in water, they already had a marked, they only had blue light sensitivity because there was only blue light hitting that water where they were developing. And so still to this day, humans are influenced by evolutionary factors that happened billions of years ago. And I just thought that was so interesting. That's why we can't sleep when we've just had blue light blasted into our eyes by our cell phones. If you want to solve this problem, there's an app called f.lux which you can install on your computer which naturally turns off the blue light pixels on your computer and just splits out uh, yellow wavelengths uh, when you're working on your computer at night and that I use it and I found I can actually go to bed straight after I've been using my computer because of it. So what you're probably most interested now that it's coronavirus lockdown is alcohol. Uh, and so <laughs> he goes about in the book talking about how alcohol acts as a sedative on your body like anesthesia. It doesn't put you to sleep into a natural deep REM sleep where you have your natural brave brain wavelengths and that that generate healthy sleep, but rather alcohol puts you in a sedative state where it just knocks you out unconscious and doesn't let you get that deep healing REM sleep that your body desperately needs. Um, it talks about also how alcohol can disrupt memory consolidation during the night from three days ago. Uh, memories and that are still being processed three days after they happened. And so if you, you know, learn stuff on a Monday and then go out drinking on the Thursday, you can still have the, me the memories that you were trying to form from Monday be impacted by your drinking on Thursday. Um, he also talks about how the best time to, talk al to drink alcohol is in the morning, because then by the time you go to bed at night, the alcohol is out of your system. So make of that what you will. Um, he talks about how the body needs a cool 18 degrees environment for sleep, as the body responds to the you know, environment around it and needs to cool down before it can fall into a good sleep. And he has a large section on sleeping pills and how bad they are, as they are exactly like alcohol, they're like sedatives, they create like anesthesia in your body and they don't let you have deep natural REM sleep and they also cause, you, cause mortality to go up and they cause a lot of other health risks like increased risk of heart attack and strokes and that. And basically how it's more important to do lifestyle interven interventions uh, and change your environment factors if you're having trouble falling asleep. And then finally, the last section that I want to talk about, why a lack of sleep is bad. So basically, driving when you're sleep deprived kills more people every year than driving drunk does. There is less productivity and bad performance in the workplace because of sleep deprivation and your mental stability and emotional maturity is wrecked when you're sleep deprived. He gave the examples of the Exxon Valdez oil spill, Chernobyl, and doctors in residency programs all over the world that are sleep deprived, all killed a lot of people because of sleep deprivation. Um, in particular, the medical residency training programs, he talked about uh, how, in the, I think it was the 1800s, John Hopkins University uh, set up their first like medical residency program, uh, and the cocaine addict William Halstatt designed the medical training program for resident students uh, and the stigma that medical residents must be exhausted was created because this man was a cocaine addict and never slept himself and so how bad is that current medical training uh, or medical residency programs that kind of forces doctors to be exhausted and operate when they're exhausted was created by a cocaine addict so many years ago that was sleep deprived i thought that was ridiculously interesting but basically, that's it for this video. Things I didn't mention included sleep disorders, the science of dreaming and its importance, and myriad other small little interesting tidbits that I really recommend you go read. Uh, I am trying to get my sleeping act together. I'm getting lots of sleep now because it's the middle of the holidays. But uh, yeah, really interesting. Would definitely recommend reading it. Uh, in the description, there are some tips for better sleep that he gave at the end of the book. But basically, the, the biggest one was to stick to a sleep schedule. Wake up at the same time every day. Uh, whether it's the weekend or the weekday, wake up at the same time, go to bed at the same time, just so that your circadian rhythm is set and it doesn't get disrupted and your body knows what to expect every day. Go to bed at the same time every day, wake up at the same time every day. But yeah, thanks for watching. I really enjoyed reading this book. Obviously, you can tell I'm bored because of coronavirus lockdown and I'm at home and doing lots of reading and trying to do some work. So this is something different and nice to do. Let me know if you'd like to see more book summaries and 
things about science and sleep and that in the future. But yeah, hope you're having a good time. Thanks for watching, if you made it this far, and uh, see you next time.